Hello, this is Bible Academy for Children. I'm Pastor Teacher Curtis Somo, and today we continue in Romans chapter 15, verse 8, after a short review. Now, as always, let's make sure that we have confessed our known sins and that we allow the Spirit of God to control us. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this opportunity that we have to study your word. We ask that our hearts and minds will be open to your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go back to Romans chapter 15, verse 1, and read through the text that we studied in our last lesson. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those without strength and not just please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For even Christ did not please himself. But just as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now may the God of perseverance and encouragement give to you to be of the same mind with one another according to Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, accept one another, just as Christ also accepted us to the glory of God. Paul now begins to bring this section to a conclusion. He's been talking about strong and weak believers getting along. In Paul's day, it was primarily the Jewish and Gentile Christians. Now we see it in our day as the weak and strong Christians. And Paul will give us two purposes of Christ's work and ministry. And then, as he often does, give us some Old Testament support. So we're going to look at verses 8 and 9 together in our reading. For I say that Christ has become a servant of circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to conform to, to confirm the promises given to the fathers, and that the Gentiles, on behalf of his mercy, glorify God, just as it is written, Therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles, and will sing to your name. So in these two verses, Paul gives two purposes of Christ's work and ministry. In other words, He's going to take and give us two purposes. And we're going to see how they tie in with what Paul has been teaching in the last chapter and up to this point. Way back to chapter 14. The first purpose basically is verse 8. For I say that Christ... All right, this is the purpose of Christ's coming, has become a servant of circumcision. That refers to the Jews. Remember, they were marked by circumcision. On behalf of the truth of God, to confirm the promises given to the fathers. So the first purpose that Paul mentions, all right, in Tying it in to what he's talking about in our passage right now, Christ came, first of all, to Jews. All right, they're the circumcision. On behalf of the truth of God, he's going to fulfill God's word to confirm. In other words, he's going to fulfill and basically 
conclude the fact that these promises are filled. He confirm to confirm the promises. Now we've studied promises in Romans. There was promises to Abraham, promises to Isaac and Jacob and David. And these promises taught that one day they would have a land, they would have a king, the people would be greatly multiplied, and we've learned that also these promises extend to the Gentile. So, verse 8 tells us the first purpose of Christ's coming was to the Jews to confirm the promises. And that's what he did. We know the story. Christ came to the Jew first. He came to the land of Israel. He ministered to his people, his own countrymen. Now and then he would come across a Gentile, but he himself says in Matthew 15, 24, let me quote that, let me get that quote up here. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. He came to the lost sheep of Israel. They needed guidance. They needed the shepherd. They needed God, and Christ was the way to God. So Christ's coming fulfilled the promises. And when we look at one of the promises to Abraham, let's look at it. That brings us to the second purpose. For I say that Christ has become a servant of circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers, here's the second purpose, and that the Gentiles on behalf of his mercy glorify God. That's the second purpose. When Abraham was given the promise that those who blessed him would be blessed, and he talked about his seed, we learned that that included the Gentiles, so that the Gentiles who trusted in Christ would also become God's people. Jesus himself had instructed the disciples who became the apostles to go out into other places. So the second pur purpose of Christ's coming is to the Gentiles, that they would end up glorifying God. And we've learned in the book of Romans that because of so many Jews rejected that the gospel then went out to the Gentiles. That's the second purpose, that they would find God's mercy. Jesus had told his apostles before he left the earth, listen to Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, that be mostly Jews, in all Judea, mostly Jews, and Samaria. Now you're going up to get the area where there were a mixture of races, Jew and Gentile, and to the ends of the earth. To the ends of the earth means to other nations, to the Gentile. So even Jesus spoke about his apostles going out to the Gentiles when he said to the ends of the earth. And you remember the promise to Abraham? I mentioned this earlier. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth, not just in Judea, not just in Israel, but on earth will be blessed through you. And of course, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they helped start the Jewish race. Jesus was a Jew. He became the Savior, and Gentiles, by believing in him, are blessed. So they're blessed through the descendants of Abraham. So the second purpose for Christ's coming and serving was for the Gentiles. They would be saved apart from the law. Remember all that stuff about the law? So Paul is bringing in the teaching 
that Christ was involved also to bring the Jew and Gentile together for God's glory. So again, Christ came to the Jews to confirm the promises and to the Gentiles so that they would eventually glorify God. Now I say he came to the Gentiles. That would come in time as Christ, remember he's the leader, he's the head of the church, as he gave orders, not only while he was on earth, but as he guided his people to go to the Gentiles. So Paul ties in these two groups in with God's purposes, and then he starts to give his Old Testament support. Remember the phrase, just as it is written? Well, when we go back and look at our two scriptures, we see that again. Just as it is written. Here, we're just going to get them up on the board so you can see them. And then the quote, Therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Now Paul, in this particular passage of scripture, and I say passage, I mean to the end of our study today, which will be about verse, uh, let's see, we will end this at verse 13. He's going to quote from the three major portions of Scripture. Let's talk about this. We're going to take a little side lesson here. He's going to quote from the law, the prophets, and the writings. The Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. Now this is the Bible that even Jews use today. Those who are even unbelievers, they still use that Old Testament. They don't use the New Testament, but they go by using the Old Testament Scripture. And it still holds true that that, that, that Old Testament Scripture is divided into, four, into three major sections. There's the Torah. That's the first five books. There I have the Hebrew word, and how it's pronounced. That includes Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. It's also sometimes referred to the law. And then there's the prophets. Now this may surprise you that they divide it this way, but they don't divide their Hebrew Bible like we do our English Bible. The prophets, the Nevi'im, and they considered Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, as under the prophets. Those books talk about the prophets: uh, Elijah, Elisha, uh, Nathan, Samuel. You see. The third section that we talk about is the writings. The writings. Let's look at those. That is pronounced Kathuvim. That includes everything else. Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Song, Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, First and Second Chronicles. Paul is going to quote from all three sections. Let's put them up there all at once. Paul is going to quote from Deuteronomy. Do you find Deuteronomy up there? That's under the Torah. He's going to quote from Isaiah. He likes to quote from Isaiah. Did you notice that? That is included. Did I leave that out? Nope. That's under the prophets, isn't it? Do you see it? Isaiah. And then the Psalms. That's under the writings. So he quotes from all three major portions of the Bible. Well, let's start to look at it. First of all, this part that he quotes, Therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. This is from the Psalm. Psalm 18, verse 49. Almost, well, we could pretty much say it's almost an exact quote. Sometimes he makes some changes. It fits better in his passage or the application. 
And there we have Psalm 1849. Therefore I will praise you, Lord, among the nations. I will sing the praise of your name. The one difference we see is the word nations. That's also the same word for Gentiles. So, when we see the word Gentiles, we should think of nations. When we see the word nations, we think of Gentiles. That's people other than the Jews. All right? So, Paul is putting in the letter to Romans the notice that even the Old Testament talks about praising God among the Gentiles or the nations. All right? So what's the first thing Paul lets us know about? That he's going to open this up to the Gentiles. That is, open up a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And he goes to Psalm and he says, I will praise you among the nations. So Paul is getting support to show the people in Romans that God always had a plan for the Gentiles. Romans 15.10 builds on this. Again he says, rejoice Gentiles with his people. Now he's got the Gentiles with his people. This is from Deuteronomy. All right, Deuteronomy 32.43. You can look that up on your own if you want. We don't need to just look up the same thing. But here we have Gentiles with the Jews. That's his people. So he's getting more into this showing that the Gentiles and Jews are together. By the way, this is another quote from the Song of Moses. We saw that in an earlier lesson. They're about to enter the land of Israel before Moses' death. In fact, this is the last verse of that song where he says, Rejoice, Gentiles, with his people. So again, an Old Testament looking forward to the Gentiles being with God's people. Verse 11, we build on these two points. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. Now the Gentiles are called to praise themselves. So the Gentiles are to praise. And what Paul is doing, again, he's taking these Old Testament quotes, all right, to show the Jews and to show the Gentiles that all along God was going to bring the Gentiles in and make them be part of God's people. Now this particular quote, uh, that says all you peoples this is from Psalm 117 it's the first verse I'm going to show you something that might surprise you Psalm 117 this is the entire psalm it's the shortest psalm it's the shortest chapter in the Bible two verses we're going to read a psalm right quick. Praise the Lord, all nations. Laud him, all peoples. For great is his love or mercy towards us, and the faithfulness or truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. That's the entire psalm. So here Paul brings in the psalm to support again that the Gentiles, all peoples, together, so again, earlier it was among the nations, the Jews are the Gentiles, now the Gentiles are told to praise, and now all people, all people, all right, let's write that in here, all people. He's got another quote, which one have we not done yet? Isaiah, that's in verse 12. 
Romans 15, 12. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse shall come, and he who rises to rule the nations, in him the Gentiles shall hope. Now this is a big step forward for the Gentiles. Let's talk about this. Let's first of all look at Isaiah <clears throat> chapter 11 and look at some of this quote. Okay? I'm going to have to make some adjustments on the margin. Here's the quote. Let's go back to Isaiah 11.8. Now let me tell you what's going on here. This is real interesting. This is discussing the millennium. Remember the thousand year reign of Christ when, when Christ will basically make over the earth. The animals, all animals will be tame. Even babies this is going to drive you crazy if you don't like snakes. But listen to this. Isaiah 11.8 The infant will play near the cobra's den. Now that's a poisonous snake today. And the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. That's where God is worshipped. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Now, Verse 10, this is what's quoted. In the day the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples, the nations will rally to seek or inquire of him, and his resting place, his residence, will be glorious. So what is Paul telling us here from Isaiah? Well, let's look at the line, the root of Jesse. That refers to Who's Jesse? That was David's father, isn't it? And David would be in the line of the Messiah. And this becomes another name for the Messiah. And Messiah basically means anointed one in the Hebrew. In the Greek, it's Christos, which we shorten to Christ. So it's talking about the Christ. He will stand as a banner. Now, what's a banner? Well, a banner is kind of like a flag, isn't it? Uh, if you ever uh, were in a group of people, they might have had their own banner. Uh, we're, the, we're the group that has uh, uh, this particular banner. Uh, it, maybe you're in a school, and your school has its own banner. Let's say it did, and you all have your own banner for your school. You may have another banner for your grade. So your banner may say, I'm in Jefferson School. I'm in the first grade. So maybe it'll say like, Jefferson first grade. And your whole school gathers together and they say, okay, get under your banner. So you go to your banner. You see, you can see where your banner is. You know they have these in the military. Have you ever seen an old movie with the cavalry? Sure. Uh, the cavalry will, will gather under their own banner or their own flag, you see. So, this tells us the Messiah will stand as a banner. All right, people will gather to him to inquire of him. Now, listen to verse 12. And again, Isaiah says... The root of Jesse shall come, that's the Messiah, and he who rises to rule the nations in him, the Gentiles shall hope. In him, the Gentiles shall hope. So, now, the Messiah, the Gentiles, will hope in the the Messiah, who's also the Christ. So what has Paul done? He's taken the Old Testament scriptures. Let me show it to you. 
Let's just sum it up. The psalmist David anticipates praising God among the Gentiles. In verse 10, the Gentiles are called to rejoice with God's people, Israel. Verse 11, the call for the Gentiles and all people to praise God. And then verse 12, the Gentiles come unto their own as this verse shows that the same hope for Israel is the hope for the Gentiles. So Paul quotes from every portion of the scripture in the Hebrew Bible to show that the Gentiles were going to come, become part of God's plan and that they do. And by the time of Paul writing Romans, they were in the family of God and the Gentiles are also the people of God. So, it includes Jews and Gentiles, all Christians, all Jew and Gentile believers, which is another way of saying all Christians are the people of God. You see? That's why Paul, in these last few verses, quoted the scripture. To show us that the Jew and Gentile together are the people of God. In verse 13, Paul gives a prayer and a wish for the Jews and the Gentiles. We can call them the weak and the strong, those who have their differences. Verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now this is quite a prayer wish. And I want us to look at its different parts. Let's look at the first part first. Now may the God of hope God is the God of hope. He's the same God for both Jew and Gentile, the weak and strong believer. He is the one who will bring to us, he will bring us into his kingdom for all believers. And then he says, fill you with all joy and peace, whether strong or weak, Jew or Gentile, Paul prays that God will fill them with joy and inner happiness that sometimes breaks out outwardly. So we'll say, praise the Lord, or God has really blessed me, you see, and peace. We've learned about peace, a couple of different types of peace. One is the peace that believers have with God, that enmity is removed when we come to Christ so that we are no longer enemies. But we also have peace and harmony with other believers. It overflows into our life and our relationship with other believers. And that is something we should always strive for, to have peace. Even when we have disagreements, we should still love one another. And of course, this helps when we have differences of opinions and so on. Okay? Now, let's look at the next part. I'm going to put the verse back up and underline the next part. As you believe, so that you will abound in hope. Believing or using your faith is an important part of your hope. Did you know that hope is basically faith looking forward? Let me show you what I mean by that. When you believe,
when you believe that when you die that you will continue on with your eternal life in the presence of God, let's just write that down, eternal life with God, you'll see Jesus Christ. That is part of your hope. Believing is looking forward to that. So when we say we have a hope, we're believing in the hope. It's looking forward to something that will one day happen. It's working towards the future. So part of, part of Paul's prayer is, is that the Roman Christians keep their faith active and growing and they will develop more confidence in their hope. And you know, the more confident you are in your hope, the more, the more perseverance, uh, you're assured of what's going to happen in the future. You say, oh, I think I'm saved. No, you don't say that. You say, I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. A person can say, how can you be so sure? I believe God's word. It's true. How can you believe it's so true? You tell them, well, you tell them what you really think. But you could say something like, because the Bible teaches God's word, and the Bible is God's word. So as I've studied it over the years, I learn more of God's word about my hope and my future, so I can persevere in troubled times. And that encourages me. And I do have a God of hope, of encouragement, and perseverance. He gives me all those things. And then we look at a very important part of this verse. That's the last phrase. I'm going to read the whole sentence again. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you will abound in hope, have lots of hope, by the power of the Holy Spirit. The joy, the peace, the abounding in hope all come by what? By the power of the Holy Spirit. Now you know that I emphasize the Holy Spirit in this ministry because it's the Holy Spirit that basically separates believers who are growing from believers who are not growing. Now what do I mean by that? Something I've said over and over. If you don't live by the power of the Holy Spirit, you're not living the Christian life. Because you can't live the Christian life under your own power. Because that means you're trying to live it by the flesh. And Christians aren't designed for that under the New Covenant. Not at all. That's why we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. He is there so we can draw on his power and he's ready to minister to us. If you study James, you know what I'm talking about. He's anxious. He's waiting. It's sort of like, you know, a horse ready to race. He's chomping at the bits. He's ready to take over when we allow him. Now, we've studied that. We studied it in Galatians. We saw it in James. And now we see it in Romans. We have the Holy Spirit and he enables us motivates us, empowers us, gives us joy and peace, and enforces our future hope. Now that's another reason you're very confident in your hope. You have the Holy Spirit. Now listen to me. He makes it real. He makes it genuine. So when you say, I have hope, the Holy Spirit convinces you. He convicts you of this truth. And you know what? The unbeliever can't understand it. Sometimes the weak believer who doesn't know the word doesn't get it either. <laughs> so Paul is praying that all these things... The joy, the peace, the hope abound by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And let me encourage you to do something. You ask God to have the Holy Spirit increase these things in your life that you'll have a greater joy, more peace, that your hope will become more solid in your thinking, that will be more real than anything else, so that one of these days your hope is more real than what you're going through on this earth. And you want these what we call Christian graces, joy, peace, hope, we could add love, to all increase in your life, your family, and those believers around you. If you have a church, I would say your church. Well, we've covered a lot of ground since chapter 14. Chapter 14, 1 through verse 13, what we just finished, is basically about loving other believers. Paul's big issue in his day was the Jew and Gentile Christian who had these differences because some of the Jews still held on to the law. And these were considered weaker believers. Now today, we have our stronger and weaker believers. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to read through the passage we just studied today, verses 8 through 13, and give you well, let me call it this, a grand review, going all the way back to chapter 14, verse 1. All right, let's first of all look at what we've just studied and see how much we can recall. For I say that Christ has become a servant of circumcision on behalf of the truth of God to confirm the promises given to the fathers. Remember, that was the first purpose of Christ's coming. That's listed here and that the Gentiles, on behalf of his mercy, glorify God. That was the second purpose. And then Paul starts to give his Old Testament support. Therefore I will give praise to you among the Gentiles and sing to your name. Again he says, Rejoice, Gentiles, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse shall come. That's the Messiah, the Christ, and he who rises to rule the nations, in him the Gentiles shall hope. So this tells us that even the Gentiles shall have the Messiah, or as we know him now, the Christ as their hope. And then the closing prayer wish of this section. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace, as you believe, so that you will abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, part of our Christian growth, as you know, is applying the Word of God. So we're going to look through several principles that we've learned. Now, this is a long review, but we're going to work our way through it to sort of Self-test us to see what we remember so we can apply it in our lives. Let's look at the first four points. Remember, Paul begins by telling the mixed audience of Gentiles, the strong uh, mixed audience of, of Gentile who's considered the strong and the Jew who's considered the weak, to accept one another and not to judge. You got that one? Two, the differing opinions back in those days would be over food and drink and days in view of the Mosaic Law. Remember the Jews were still, some of them were still trying to follow the law. Three, the Jews would avoid certain foods and drinks and set aside certain days to keep the law. For the Gentiles were not restricted as to food, drink, and days because they did not follow the Mosaic Law. They weren't raised under that. Now, what about today? That brings us to our next few points.
5 through 9. Now since today we do not have this problem with mixed Jewish and Christian audiences, with these issues, that means the, the food and the drink in the days, there's no direct application here for us. I doubt that any of you are sinning among Jews right now, or are Jew yourself who still follows the Mosaic Law. 6. However, we can take some of the principles with a limited application for today. 7. Those who are serving Christ should allow others to grow and serve without judging them. Now that particularly is to the strong, to allow the young believer, the new believer, who's considered weaker. There's nothing wrong with being weak. It's just that it becomes wrong if you decide not to grow, you see. So, number seven again, those who are serving Christ, that means those who truly want to serve the Lord, should allow others to grow and serve without judging them. Eight, we are to remember that Christ is the Lord of us all, <clears throat> that we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and that we all are to live and die for Christ. Do you remember those verses? We'll all stand before the judgment seat. We study the judgment seat. And they were all to live and die for Christ. Nine. We are to love one another with the objective of building up another in the faith and tear no one down. <clears throat> Point ten. <clears throat> Do not cause offense toward the young, weak, and growing believer. If necessary, keep what you know to yourself so as not to offend. 12. Do not do anything that would cause another to violate his conscience. 13. This could lead to be an obstacle or even worse, a trap so that he would fall in his faith. This could lead, I left out the word too here, to be an obstacle, or even worse, a trap, so that he would fall in his faith. 14. All believers are to be using their faith in whatever they do. Does it line up with the word of God? Are we believing it? Are we applying it? Are we in the power of the Spirit? So we are a people who live by the word of God. Sometimes some of us know more than others, and we may do things that those others don't do. That's okay. And it's not always easy to sort these things out. It doesn't mean we want anybody to sin. All right? That's always true. And we certainly don't want to sin. But we don't want others to violate their conscience either. We don't want them to make them think they have to do it this way. Or they're not doing God's will. For them who are still growing, don't have information, they work on what they know. Alright? Verse 15. I mean point 15. But let me give you an illustration first of all. Let's hold off on that for a second. Let's talk about, uh, an, uh, let's give me, let me give you an illustration where a believer who's strong and a believer and weak, one that you might even come across. The weak believer, here's what the weak believer thinks. This is what he's been taught. He says, we only have church where we worship on Sundays. That's when we go hear the preacher preach. That's when we may go to Sunday school and gather for our fellowship. All right? The strong believer, he says, I can go to church every day. I can study the Bible every day. 
I can meet with other believers and study the Bible any day. Let's put any day too, all right? We have Bible studies Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday. And then sometimes we get together on Saturday, say two times a month. We have a time of fellowship and enjoying each other. We have a meal together. The weak believer looks over and goes, how can they do that? I'm not even motivated to go that much. The strong believer looks at the weak believer and says, well, when he decides to really grow, then maybe he'll realize that you can study the word every day and the Bible teaches that it allows that. The weak believer says, I didn't know that. I didn't know we could do that. Wow, that frees us up. Do we have to meet on Sundays? The strong believer says, no. Some of us have to work on Sundays. Do you have to meet Sunday morning? No. Sometimes we meet Mondays. I'm that way with my family, by the way. If we have to, someone has to work late, we may delay it on Monday. Now, I don't like doing that, so we try to get it in Sunday morning. That way, most everybody's usually home. I'm sometimes the one that have to, has to work Sunday morning, and that messes us up. But as soon as we can, we get together. That might be Sunday night. It may be Monday night. But you see, the strong believer knows these things. The weak believer doesn't. The strong believer has to allow the weak believer to grow out of these things. Come across those scriptures that teach that we can study every day and that we're not restricted to Sundays. You see, Sunday only worship is a tradition. It's a tradition. The strong believer says, well, we don't have to follow that tradition. We have the Bible to, to learn by. Now, over here, is this person sinning? Is this a sin for the weak believer over here? No. Is it a sin for the strong believer to worship or gather every day or any day? No. Now, here's where it can become a sin. If the strong believer tells this weak believer, you know, you should be studying every day, and that if you don't, God's not pleased. Well, now the strong believer just now put up a legalistic standard. So the weak believer thinks, well, that's not very strong. So now the weak is judging the strong. So you got to be careful. And the strong believer is trying to impose something on the weak that he can't do. And so the weak decides, well, I, I'm going to make myself study every day. I'm going to make myself gather every day. And before you know it, the weak is overwhelmed. Now, I want to be careful here. As a strong believer you be very careful about what you try to tell the weak believer. And weak believers, you be very careful about judging the strong because if you start being too critical and too judgmental before that, before you know it, you get into sin. You're judging people. And the strong believer has to be careful that he doesn't cause the weak believer to do something he can't do yet. You see, And you don't want to make, as a strong believer, the weak believer feel guilty about not studying every day. Tell them, you can study every day. Now, I'm one of those who often emphasize to people to read your Bible every day. Now, I know that people have choices. And sometimes they choose not to study their Bible every day. But I also tell them, it's up to you. It's between you and the Lord. But I also know that if you really want to grow, then you need to spend your time in the Word every day. But then, often, weaker believers don't want to grow. Well, that's a different group. All right? Now we have... Oops, I didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> now we have a group...
that is not really interested in growing. And that's a different set of people altogether. But we're assuming here that the weak wants to grow. So we're going to call him the growing weak believer. He's just growing. The strong believer, be careful about imposing your views and trying to make people feel guilty. Or make them come with you to Bible study when they're just not, they can't handle that yet. They have a lot of tradition to work out of their hearts. And it may take some time. And let me tell you, when you get hungry enough for the Word of God, you want to read it every day. You may even want to sit out and do a video every day or Bible study of some sort. So that's one way in which this can be applied. There are many other things we could bring in. I mentioned earlier about how people dress. Be careful about being critical of people any time they come to church. Some people are poor, all right, and they don't have really nice clothes. Some people are wealthy, and they may wear jewelry and real fancy clothes. Well, there can be a problem with that, too, you see. But just don't be getting on to people for things like that. Those are non-essentials. All right? They used to, in the old days, they used to kind of say, women are not supposed to wear makeup. Can you imagine that? Don't wear lipstick. A good Christian woman won't wear lipstick or jewelry. Well, we don't really think about that much today, but that's a non-essential too, you see? Well, that gives you some illustrations to work with. Let's go on with our points. Picking up on verse, excuse me, I said it again, didn't I? Point 15. Stronger believers are to bear the burden of the weaker growing believer. Notice I said growing. 16. Love one another. Accept one another. This brings glory to God. 17. Just as God has always planned. Now this is the last few verses we looked at. Just as God has always planned for the Gentile to become God's people and that the Jews have been God's people, both should recognize that God wants them to get along and come together as the body of Christ. Finally, verse 18. That's our last point. So also weak and strong believers should be considerate and non-judgmental, loving one another, willing to be flexible and accepting of others and not make non-essential issues a reason to divide. Let's pray. Father, this has been quite a series of lessons regarding how to deal with other believers. Lord, help us love others. Help us abound in love, in joy and peace, and the power of the Spirit. We ask these things in Jesus' name.